Hello everybody and welcome to the very first windsurfing video podcast in which we hope to bring you news, views, reviews of everything that's going on in the world of windsurfing today. The harbour has a pebble beach and is shallow for some distance out, so it's great for learning. There's plenty of space and no sand for rigging up on and having a chat with the locals about sail size. There's even a cafe, changing facilities and toilets, all great value for the five pounds that you pay for the whole day. But do get there early, as it does tend to fill up quite quickly. So let's meet one of the locals. Okay, we're here on the beach at Portland Harbour with Duncan Adam. Hello. <laughs> uh, who we know from the Boards Forum. We've caught up with him today and we thought we'd interview him for the, uh, for the podcast. Now, uh, when did you start windsurfing? Ooh, 1986, I think. So, uh, as far as I can remember, yeah. Okay, and wh what was the reasons for you taking up windsurfing? Uh, I was doing jet skiing at a lake opposite a wind windsurfing lake, and uh, the jet skiing was getting too expensive, and it was getting a little bit boring, and I thought, well, I'll give windsurfing a try. F first attempt at it, and I got hooked, and basically, that was in a September, and went through the winter learning how to uh, stay on it, which uh, was at the old style way the boards. But uh, it was like, good fun. Like that one up there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, what's your favourite piece of kit that you own? Ooh, probably the one bit that I haven't tried yet, which is the Tommen uh, RS60, uh, which is my 90 litre uh, slalom board, but I've yet to get it out on the water. I only had it for a couple of weeks. Okay. And what's been your best moment in windsurfing? Probably for flat water, uh, I would say getting the GPS reading well over 30 knots for a 500 meter run. So what was the exact speed? Well, 32 and a half, I think. I've got it on the uh, speed surfing uh, website. Uh, but then it's got all the details that I can't remember exactly, but something like 32 and a half. And the half isn't uh, an additional half that you just added on? No, uh, it's about 32 and a half with a peak of about 33 and a half, I think. Really? Cool. What's your worst moment in windsurfing? Uh, probably the other week when I uh, did my knee in wave sailing and uh, basically uh, that's kept me off the water for a couple of weeks and then uh, holiday and one or two other things and I haven't really had a chance to get out in the last month. Uh, Has the knee injury improved your sailing? 
No, not, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> okay, and finally, um, what's the best thing you think about windsurfing? You get to wear boots on the water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Adam Lear, and this is The Beach. <laughs> As windsurfers, we're all obsessed by the weather, so we thought we'd find out what sites are out there on the worldwide wait to assist us in deciding whether it's worth venturing out onto the water or not. We don't all know what's happening out there, so let's see which sites make the most sense out of it all. Starting with xcweather.co.uk, this is a nicely presented site showing wind strength and direction by varying coloured arrows. Click on an arrow and you'll get an hour by hour forecast for the entire week. Next up, it's windguru.cz. Here you can select any UK or worldwide location to get an hour by hour, day by day forecast again. They even have a star rating system. Bring on the five star days, I say. Ah, the good old Auntie Beeb is next. With their websites quite comprehensive, but what they really do have that's quite pretty is some very cute little pressure charts that animate for you. Nice to watch. Talking of age old institutions, the Met Office. Nice sight, it looks like the pressure charts have been drawn by a nine year old. And finally, my personal favourite, windfinder.com. It's a great site with great graphics and loads of information and all the usual forecasts, but it's real draw are these amazing colour charts that show forecasts up to two weeks ahead. Very visual, very simple. Right, today we've come down to Cheam in Surrey to visit Brian at Blue Chip Windsurfing and we're going to talk to him all about board repairs and sail repairs and what we can do as windsurfers to minimise our problems on the water and what to do when we've had problems on the water. So Brian, how long have you been repairing boards and sails? Boards and sails since 1980, but I did start off on composite repairs in 1974. What steps can windsurfers take to minimise damage to their equipment? Not fall on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things. Learners damage equipment and uh, guys trying new tricks, they damage equipment. Now, what is the most common damage to a board and to a sail? To a board, it would be nose impact, and it's nowadays it's, it's not so much boom impact as it used to be because boards are getting shorter, it's the mast impact. And that is the most common damage that we have to repair here is mast impacts on the nose of the board. Um, on a sail, basically it's body shaped holes going through panels. Can you still sail a board or a sail after you've damaged it? Well, a board, if you've uh, broken the outer structure so that the core is exposed you should seal that up as quickly as possible and there's loads of um, DIY products that will do that. Once that's sealed you can carry on sailing usually as long as it's not hugely difficult. Uh, sails, again you should really seal the crack. Um, it, it monofilm will run, once it's begun to tear it will run. If it's a small hole you can fix it virtually permanently with some of the, uh, the heavy duty monofilm repair kits you can get. Uh, but if it's a big hole, you've really got to stop because the worst thing, worst scenario is you lose part of the sail, then it's very difficult to repair it. What's your opinion on modern sail designs and materials, i.e. the Dacron in Super Freaks? Um, well, the Super Freak might well be a good sail, but uh, I think it's really common knowledge that we've moved on from using Dacron as a, a major material in sail manufacture, particularly because of the stretching. The monofilm doesn't stretch, whereas Dacron, it does stretch. But is monofilm durable enough for a sail material? Well, that's always very debatable. It's durable so long as you don't hit it with uh, pointed objects. You can fall into it and that won't damage a panel, um, but if the if you've got a sharp area on your harness, then that could damage it and it would go straight through. Very difficult to damage. Even when it's suffered real trauma like that. Ripping the edge. But, if you get a small tear in it... And finally, the most controversial question of them all. Do you wear boots when you sail? Nope. Did, but don't anymore. Excellent, that's very good news. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay.